federal agents in Oregon on January 26th with his hands raised in the air. What of the night that he died? This is called the Battle of Lavoy Finnegum and Cowboys Stand for Freedom.
is perfect for this job. This is our last opportunity to hold these five fine candidates, feet to the fire, and see what their medal is. For 24 years, the man I'm talking about has been recruiting libertarians, primarily on the West Coast, but at different times when he's on serious radio and different other broader markets, he competed with Ron Paul in our area to bring people to the Libertarian Party. He was passed up for the lead role in Straight Outta Compton. <laughs> However, 24 years ago, he did secure and maintain the lead role as the sage from South Central. He is now on over 200 stations on a nationally syndicated radio show of Sailor Broadcasting. He has also last year had, he's earned a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And with great pleasure, I introduce to you Larry Elder. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Anderson Cooper. <laughs> a brief word about the Libertarian Party. It was founded in 1971 in part as a reaction to the Vietnam War and concern over the direction of U.S. monetary policy. In 1996, the party earned ballot status in all 57 states, or as President Obama says, all 57 states, <laughs> becoming the third party to do so in two consecutive presidential elections. In 2012, the former New Mexico Governor Jerry Johnson was the party's presidential candidate. And he seeks the nomination again this year. More about him later. I'll now introduce the candidates. I'd like them all to sign in as they come in. Mr. John McAfee.
starring Judge Andrew Napolitano on Fox Business Channel. And finally, Dr. Mark Allen Friedman. Excuse me, Feldman. Dr. Mark Allen Feldman. for 11 years. I welcome you all. These are the 2016 Libertarian Presidential Candidates. Socialist and populist nationalism? 
E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Our campaign for liberty is prepared to lead this party and our nation to great victories for our common cause of economic freedom and personal liberty. I promise that no matter the outcome of tomorrow's election at the end of the day, we will all stand together, united, and we will fight arm in arm for the future of our nation and for the future of liberty itself. Thank you.
Most libertarians think both major parties are bad, but that the Republican Party is, at least as to economic issues, the lesser of two evils. What do you say to people who believe that, in the best case scenario, the libertarian candidate this year might get 10%. In a close election, the libertarian will likely take more votes from the Republican, making it more likely that Hillary will win the election. response to that line of thinking? Math and <laughs> There are exit polls that are done and questions asked of voters that vote for libertarians. If the libertarian were not in the race, who would you have voted for? And it's almost even split between Democrat and Republican with a sizable number that would say, I would not have voted otherwise. Well, fact factually speaking, my name has appeared in three national polls, 10%, 10%, and 11%. And in those polls, they actually did an analysis and pulled more votes away from Hillary uh, than from Trump. But I think at the end of the day, we pull equally from both sides. And the idea isn't just to get to 10%. The idea here is to actually get to 15% and be in the presidential debates, posing, creating a real opportunity to tell the people of the world a different view on all of these topics. Face with the choice of the lesser of two evils, vote for neither. <laughs> Exit polls in Virginia after Robert Sarvis's race for, for governor showed that he pulled more from the Democrats than he did from the Republicans. In order to arrive at left or right, you could be born a Republican or a Democrat. But in order to become a libertarian, one must first think to arrive at our positions. <laughs> Of course, the friends of big governments always look at us libertarians and say, hmm, you look like you've had a little too much to think. Vote libertarian! <laughs> Dr. Feldman. I'm a doctor, not a governor, but thank you. <laughs> I said Dr. Feldman. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's, is it possible for me to win the nomination? Is it possible for the Libertarian to become the next President of the United States? Of course it is, because all it takes is a miracle. And miracles happen. <laughs> Who makes miracles happen? I'm looking at them right now. <laughs> Mr. McAfee. Through 14 presidential elections, and I can promise you whether the Democrats or the Republicans have gotten in, my life has been worse. There has been more government control and oppression. I have lost my freedom and my privacy. My taxes have gone up. To me, I don't care. I want to know who the wizard is behind the curtain that creates these clowns that we're voting for. Please. Let's turn, gentlemen, to the economy. My first question goes to Governor Johnson. Donald Trump, when asked to name three functions of government, said national security, health care, and education. Where did he go wrong? <laughs> you know, I really don't even want to comment on, uh, on Donald Trump. I really don't. I really think that uh, when Donald Trump talks about deporting 11 million illegal immigrants, uh, that's just wrong. When he talks about building a fence across the border, that is just wrong. When he talks about killing the families of Muslim terrorists, that is just wrong. When he talks about free market, that he's gonna force Apple to make their iPads and their iPhones in the United States, that's just wrong. When he talks about a 35% tariff, that's just wrong. When he says he's gonna bring back waterboarding or torture or whatever. see 
you what has become of our nation when a man who is truly the definition of a fascist sits at the top of the Republican ticket. The forces of darkness are on the march in the United States, and only the Libertarian Party can save us. We will stand united against the forces of populist nationalism because nationalism is only ever a means to an end, not the end itself. If nationalism leads to individual rights, then it is useful. But the Founding Fathers knew that when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for us to list the causes of our separation, we must have a revolution. And if Donald Trump wins the nomination, we should revolt! Dr. Feldman. If Donald Trump thinks health care, the economy, and national security are important, I'm glad that asshole finally got something right. But it's not the government to do it. It's our job. It's our money, and it's our job. I don't want to tell our government, leave us alone. I want to tell our government, relax. We got this. Mr. Matthew. Nearly a hundred million, a hundred billion dollars a year into education, and we're near at the bottom. Another hundred billion, we'll all be illiterate. <laughs> and in terms of health care, please, God, that's our second largest expense in this country. And you ask the veterans, are they benefiting? Please, no, no they're not. We use those are not the priorities, my friend. Mr. Perry. <laughs> say that it's a flawed question that was asked of Mr. Trump. They probably intended to ask what is the legitimate function of government, and I would say there isn't one. Yeah. Although, although, the Declaration of Independence does say that governments exist with the consent of the governed and are supposed to protect life, liberty, and property. So if there is a government, that's the function. Protect life, liberty, and property. But I think you're smart enough to be your own government. This next question is to Mr. Peterson, he'll start. Should illegal immigration be stopped? Do you believe in open borders? If so, what does open borders mean? I believe that a free market in labor is just as effective in lifting people out of poverty as a free market in commodities. Because what business does the government have to get in between an employer and a private contract between an employee? Borders are imaginary lines drawn on a map by politicians. And the nation state, the nation state sees fit only to serve the needs of the individuals. Now, despite the fact that I believe in the freest world possible, I believe that we as libertarians can offer to the American people a solution that we have had. And our history shows that during the progressive era, ooh, progressives, but good that we had an Ellis Island policy. Oh, man. Yeah, so the ship is here. The immigrants are here. <laughs> Doctor. Drive time. Dr. Feldman. Dr. Feldman, I was buzzed over a couple of times. Yeah. So America is the land of opportunity. Give us your poor, your tired, your huddled, huddled masses yearning to break free. I will streamline this immigration system, and we will have liberty for Americans, and we will be welcoming immigrants under my administration. Dr. Kelly. Like all libertarians, I believe that every human being has human rights. And the rights you're born with don't matter which side of an imaginary line you were born on. We have illegal immigration because the multinational corporations and the wealthy corporate leaders like Ill illegal immigration. They like having uh, low-skilled, uh, low-paid workers, and uh, we need to empower them and open the borders. Thank you. Mr. McAfee, the question is about open borders. I am an immigrant. I came over when I was two years old. My father was an American serviceman in the Second World War. All of your ancestors were immigrants. What does the illegal mean? Our first immigrants had to stay in America for six months to become an American. What's wrong with that? Please, open every border. We need diversity, we need work, we need creating people. Do you think the people coming here escaping the present government are a problem? Only 
if we are our anniversary government. Mr. Perry, no human being is illegal. What, what will open borders look like under President Perry? Well, I'll tell you, we already have the policy in place. We just need to remove parts of it. There's a policy called the wet foot, dry foot policy, where if you have dry feet and you're from Cuba, you get to stay in the United States. We need to implement that for every person around the globe. Revoke the wet foot where the Coast Guard looks for people to send them back to tyranny. Governor Johnson, we should make it as easy as possible for somebody that wants to come into this country and work to be able to get a work visa. And a work visa should entail a background check and a social security card that applicable taxes get paid. We should not build a fence across the border. We should not deport 11 million illegal immigrants. We need to embrace immigration in this country. We need to recognize that these are the cream of the crop when it comes to workers coming across the border. They are not taking jobs that US citizens want, and it is not an issue of lower pay unless it's an, an issue of language, and they are the first ones that recognize that. Dr. Feldman, should taxpayers pay for or subsidize education at any level, whether K through 12 or post-secondary education? Yes, for their children. <laughs> Not for other people's children. People should be empowered to educate themselves and their kids. We shouldn't take that responsibility away from people. Mr. McAfee. There is an offensive word in your question, and the word is taxpayer. Um, no, absolutely not. Taxpayers should pay for nothing that they do not receive goods or services for. Mr. Perry, there should not be government-run schools. That does not mean that I oppose education. I love education, and to quote Mark Twain, I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. Every one of you in this room and watching at home can get an MIT education right now absolutely free. They have put all of their courses online. You can take them right now. Go there, MIT. All of the courses online absolutely free. Go to Khan Academy. You can learn anything you want for free. Governor Johnson. As governor of New Mexico, I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice. For six straight years, I proposed a full-blown voucher program to bring competition to public education, unleash tens of millions of entrepreneurs to deliver better education in this country. With regard to the federal role when it comes to education, abolish the Federal Department of Education. attached, 15 cents worth of strings attached, and now Obama wants to add a bathroom to that, so now it's up to 16 cents. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Well, Kerry took all my good applause lines. <laughs> America, what you wish. Yeah, America, <laughs> America became the greatest nation in the world because of the one-room schoolhouse with uh, nothing more than a pencil and a piece of paper. And now we spend more on our education than any civilized uh, nation in the world. It's not an issue of money. It's an issue of centralization, central economic planning. We must stop these central economic planners and their control over the lives of our children. We need more homeschooling. We need to allow the states to decide these problems. We need to end the Federal Department of Education once and for all. Mr. McAfee, even President Obama said the three biggest entitlements programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, are, in his word, unsustainable. They comprise nearly 50% of the federal budget. What would you do about them? Social Security is a special issue because we have committed to people who have paid a substantial percentage of their work and salary into this program. 
I don't think anyone under the age of 40 believes you will get any of that back. I'm sorry, you people, we will have to treat differently. The rest of these entitlement programs, I'm sorry, it sounds uh, unsavory perhaps, or even uncaring, even though it is not. They are not helping those people, and certainly not our nation. <laughs> Mr. Perry. As with everything, I believe they should be completely voluntary. How many people in here, and I actually do want to show of hands, love grandmas? How many of you would donate money to feed grandmas? I did not see a single person that did not raise their hand. That's how you fund Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. Governor Johnson. I think the only way that you reform Medicaid and Medicare is to devolve those functions to the states. 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice. As governor of New Mexico, in my heart of hearts, if given a fixed amount of money, uh, I could have delivered health care to those uh, on welfare and those over 65. With regard to Social Security, it's absolutely fixable, but it's raising the retirement age, it's having a very fair means testing, it's being able to self-direct those, those funds in a way that you see fit. One of the great untold inequities in our country is that poor people who pay into Social Security their entire lives and die, that money reverts to the government as opposed to their heirs. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. I say it's time to allow young people to opt out of Social Security. <laughs> but they stole the money from us in the first place, so I think they should have to give it back. Yeah. Now, when it comes to how we can get out of Social Security's problems, I think that if we did implement a flat tax on the road to abolishing the income tax entirely, that we would get more revenue. Because as of now, only 27% of the suckers pay their taxes. If we had a flat tax, perhaps we would get more revenue and we could plug the gap with Social Security as we allow the young people to opt out. It's time for us to opt out. Yeah. Dr. Feldman. Government programs are almost always bad deals. We need new ideas. I had the idea, let people on Social Security voluntarily invest in student debt. That decreases the student debt from 12% or 8% to 2%, and then it increases the return to our secure, Social Securities up from 1% to 2%, doubling their benefits. <laughs> let, let, the, let, our, let people take care, let people in mid-career take care of the educational opportunities for the kids, and then when the kids get jobs, they can support the, so, the retirements of their elders. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Perry. If you don't believe government should force people into some sort of social security or forced savings system, what happens when someone has grown old but was too indifferent or irresponsible to have set aside savings? What should happen to that person? I believe I answered that question in the answer to my last question. People here that like grandma would donate to grandma. You would have voluntary mutual aid programs as we did before the government took over social security. Johnson. People to do things is always wrong. It doesn't matter what good you do with the stolen money. Governor Johnson? Well, I'm not advocating that Social Security should be abolished. It should be self-directed as much as possible. And as President of the United States, I would sign legislation that would allow 100% of Social Security funds to be self-directed. But I don't think that they're going to pass that. So in the meantime, like I say, the reforms that are needed, raise the retirement age, you could have a very fair means testing, um, self-directed funds, and allow those that pay into secure Social Security and die before the amount of money that they paid in was actually paid back, perhaps that could be passed on to their heirs, and that could also be a part of very fair means testing. Mr. Perry. I answered first. Sorry, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Damn right it is. No one, no one was dying on the streets before Social Security. This is about social engineering and control. It's time to end Social Security and welfare programs once and for all. Now, a lot of people don't know this story, but when the Pilgrims first came to the United States, they had a system. It was from each according to his ability and to each according to his need. And what happened? They ate each other because they were starving to death. 
How did they create the system that we have? The bounty, the cornucopia, copia, the horn of plenty. The Thanksgiving feast came because they had private property rights and they had free markets, and that's how we will take care of the poor. Doctor Phil, divorce somebody needs help. The easier it is for voluntary private organizations to give them help. They don't need help at the point of a government gun. <laughs> Mr. McAfee. None of us are going to pass a child drowning in a river, even if we're dressed in a tuxedo heading to our wedding. You don't think about it, you jump in, you save the child. Everyone has a neighbor, a friend, Someone is going to care. Libertarianism is not heartlessness. It's the opening of the heart to your neighbor. Governor Johnson, does global warming or climate change pose a threat to the planet? Well, I think the real question here is, is, uh, is carbon emissions, and we should be, as consumers, we are looking to reduce carbon emission. And in that context, um, the free market uh, has bankrupted coal. Uh, it's something that we've demanded, it's something that has happened. I'm not smart enough to say whether or not global warming is man-made. Certainly there, are, there is climate change that is occurring. Does that have to do with the sun and the relationship of the earth? I know that Harrison Schmidt, uh, who walked on the moon and was senator from New Mexico, he really questions whether global warming takes place or not. But that said, carbon emissions is something that we genuinely, as human beings, want to see reduced. Coal is a good example of having been bankrupted by the free market. This is free market forces at work that have refused to put any money into coal. It's a fact. It's a fact. Mr. Peterson, does global warming pose a threat to the planet? The free market didn't bankrupt the coal industry. It was regulations and President Obama. Should the government do anything about it? 
And I say no. <laughs> Mr. Peterson, what taxes, if any, do you believe in? How should government fund its essential duties and obligations? I believe in a voluntary society, freely, totally, completely. If we are to have taxes, why not a lottery? A lottery is just a tax on people who are bad at math. <laughs> The first president of the United States, George Washington, did sign lottery taxes because they said, George, how are we going to build the roads? So he found a way without coercing his citizens to, have, to allow a chance for us to find the most, uh, the, the best way for us to serve one another. The question is, who will, isn't who will build the roads, we will build the roads. So when it comes to taxation, taxation is theft. But I... We have a responsibility to take care of each other, but we can do that without government stealing from us. Taxation is theft, and it's the worst kind of theft, because we, our government convinces people that what belongs to them belongs to the government. It's a lie, it's our money, it's not their money. Yeah. Mr. Manifee. This government survived, and this nation survived for 150 years with no income taxes. How is that possible? We had a government that was doing reasonable things at small cost. No taxation that involves the sweat of your brow can possibly be legal, and taxation was illegal until 1916. We can fund this government voluntarily. We have national parks. If you want to go to the park, pay some money. If you want to drive on a road, pay a dollar for every thousand miles you drive. We can do this. But to do this, we have to stop the insanity of a government out of control and growing like a weed. And we can do that. <laughs> Mr. Perry. With all due respect, your question is invalid because it presumes there are essential duties of government. <laughs> If you want NASA to exist and send things into space, write a check to NASA. If you want the U.S. military to drone bomb children in the Middle East, write a check to the U.S. military. But don't force me to pay for it. Governor Johnson. I've always said the best example of a libertarian tax is the gas tax. You use gas, you drive on the highways, now the problem with the gas tax is it gets co-opted for other things. But that said, taxation is theft. Uh, I, I, I'm running for President of the United States, so if elected, I'm going to pass any legislation that reduces taxes in this country, um, however that is. But what I would advocate is eliminating income tax, corporate tax, and because we would do that, we would then be able to abolish the IRS, which is about as tyrannical as it is. I would, be, I would be elected president of the United States. I don't think Congress is going to abolish income tax and corporate tax without replacing with something. I think that they could replace it with a consumption tax. I would ask you to look at the fair tax as a way to dot the I's and cross the T's on how to accomplish one federal consumption tax. Are we skipping to Austin, or are you asking Dr. Feldman to think I answer? The tax. You already answered that. Yes. Yeah. So this next question goes to Dr. Feldman. Yes. Okay. Dr. Feldman, should there be a minimum wage? If not, how do you prevent employees from, as the left often says, exploiting workers? The minimum wage is always zero. Ask anybody who doesn't have a job because the government is in control of the economy. We should raise wages for everybody by making more demand for working people to be productive. Thank you. Mr. Manifee, do we need a minimum wage in a free market where you are worth a certain amount 
and you're not getting paid, and you may walk across the street at your will and get paid what you are deserved. No, it will happen. Minimum wages are an illusion. An illusion. It has nothing to do with whether we are men or women or straight or gay or young or old. It has to do with what can you do and what is that worth? That's the free market. <laughs> Mr. Perry. I have a question for those that actually support a minimum wage, and hopefully it's nobody in this room, so look at this as rhetorical. As a small business owner, there are times when I actually don't make the minimum wage based on the amount of hours that I work versus what I bring in. So my question to you is if you support a minimum wage, who should I steal the money from to make up the difference? Governor Johnson? missing the boat on this argument. Look, $15 minimum wage, let's raise it to $75. Come on, let's be the most prosperous nation in the world. Let's raise the minimum wage to 75 bucks. Well, when you think about it, gee, somebody, no, you can't do that for anybody advocating the minimum wage. Oh, you can't do that, but you can do $15 or $12 or $7.50. Look, the minimum wage is the minimum wage. That's what it's called. It's not a living wage. It's a starting wage. It's the minimum wage. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. The minimum wage was originally passed to stop black laborers from competing with white labor. It was racist. Now, the real minimum wage is zero dollars, and it is harmful for the poor. Why? Because it harms the people who are unemployed, who are unskilled, who are unable to get jobs. Because if you have to pay $15 an hour, you're going to hire the best worker you can instead of the boy next door. We must put a stop to minimum wage so that we can lift the poor and the middle class out of poverty. Mr. Madison, should government, whether state or local, fund infrastructure, roads, bridges, sewers, electrical grids, and if government does not do it, who or what will? Each of those are separate problems. We have interstate highways. There are issues involved in right-of-way uh, and various um, intricate problems involving uh, uh, eminent domain. So we have to address that differently than local problems. With our solar power and our new technologies, local uh, facilities can be uh, created to generate that. So, but the government should, at the maximum, be involved in the minimum part of this entire issue. <laughs> Mr. Perry? I'll do my best to answer this in 30 seconds. We're in a hotel. Hotels thrive on having customers stay in their hotel, which means people need to get to their hotel, which means that people are probably coming to visit and do stuff. All of these places thrive on customers, meaning that they need a flat surface for all of their customers to come and go from. Businesses will be incentivized to have these flat surfaces called roads. We don't need to steal the money. Let the people who thrive from them pay for them. <laughs> Voluntarily, of course. <laughs> Governor Johnson. Well, infrastructure is the best example of how you can privatize this entire function, and you can do this through user fees to be able to accomplish that. Should government be in charge of that process? Well, you're probably going to have government administrate over it or issue a request for proposal to see this happen, but no, government shouldn't be involved in this. The private sector can be involved in this. Entrepreneurs can be involved in this and can apply the best taxes possible, which are user fees, by those that in fact use the infrastructure. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Ah, uh, the old who will build the roads. <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> because the truth is, is that in the future we'll have a jetpack. The state is unimaginative. They don't see a future where freedom can solve the problems that, that, that are created by government. The free market can solve these problems. Take a look at what happened in Hurricane Katrina when people were suffering and there was no electricity. What happened? People stepped in and they started offering generators and people said, oh wow, look, they're charging for these generators two, three times more than you might have learned on the free market. 
But they call them price gougers. But the truth is, is that supply and demand worked. And it uh, looks like I'm out of time. But uh, who will build the roads? Come on, roads. We don't need that. We don't need government to build roads. Dr. Feldman. The Constitution of the United States says all the government can do is what's necessary and proper. My balance and credit plan, balance the budget and keep it balanced, change all charitable contributions to dollar for dollar tax credits, puts each American in control of every dollar. If they don't want to send money to the IRS, they can send it to private voluntary charitable organizations to take care of grandmas and build roads and bridges and take care of veterans and do all the things that would need to be done and then there's nothing necessary or proper for the government to take care of. Mr. Perry, assume someone has a pre-existing medical condition and cannot get health insurance. What would you do about it? Well, it's not the president's responsibility to make sure that anybody has health insurance. Let's look at St. Jude Hospital for a moment. They take care of children that have cancer. They don't charge the families a dime. They thrive off of private voluntary contributions. Dr. Johnson? Uh, when it comes to health care, what we need is a real free market approach to health care. And by the way, health care is about as far removed from the free market as it possibly could be. We would, we would have health insurance to cover ourselves for catastrophic injury and illness, and we would pay as you go in a system that was very, very affordable. We would have stitches are us. We would have gallbladders are us. We would have uh, x-rays are us. Uh, for a pre-existing condition, uh, look, before uh, President Obama's affordable health care plan, nobody was going without health care in this country. It, it in fact became um, no one, somebody with a pre-existing condition was always receiving health care. It was just an issue of who paid for it. I think we've muddied this. I think uh, Supreme Court Justice Roberts was right when he said that health care is a tax. My health care insurance premiums have quadrupled, and I haven't been to see a doctor in four years. Mr. Peterson. If you own a fire insurance company and people were allowed to buy insurance after their house was on fire, you would go bankrupt. The laws of supply and demand will eventually catch up to them. And what this does is it forces insurance companies into an untenable economic situation because the communists want single payer health care. It's time for us to allow the free market to work and the insurance cartels by allowing people to purchase insurance across state lines. Dr. Feldman. I support universal health care. Everyone universally should care about their own health. <laughs> With a balance and credit program that provides billions of dollars for individuals to each decide how to spend their money to support their fellow man, women, children, and when they're donating money to do that, because the budget is balanced, the government will have to decide where to cut and cut and cut and cut, where the private sector is already doing things better. Mr. McAfee. In 1950, health care was 4% of the gross domestic product. It is now 20%. Have we become that much sicker? What's happened in the interim? Doctors used to come to your house and leave. Now they are terrified of doing anything because of malpractices and all the other barriers to doctors making a living. If we got back to a rational cost, the health insurance would be far less important. Please see this. Governor Johnson, on trade, would you continue trading with partners who impose tariffs on American goods and on those who engage in, as Donald Trump puts it, currency manipulation? Uh, look, I believe in free trade. There shouldn't be tariffs anywhere, and the United States can lead on this uh, by example. Uh, when you talk about a 35% tariff on foreign goods, who ends up paying for that? Well, we do. Mr. Peterson. If foreign countries want to throw rocks in their harbors, let them. We should be the, the beacon of liberty and free trade. 
Even Paul Krugman believes that free trade lifts people out of poverty. One billion lives saved due to free market capitalism and free trade, and as President of the United States, that's what I'm a champion. Dr. Feldman, the question is, would you continue trading with partners who impose tariffs on American goods and on those who engage in what Donald Trump calls currency manipulation? We can be fair, and if they won't be fair with us, we'll trade with somebody else. I have a big trade deficit with my barber. I give him money, he gives me haircuts. He never gives me money. <laughs> we need free trade, and free trade doesn't need an agreement. Mr. McAfee. Yes, free trade does not uh, need a government approval. If there is a tariff on goods and services, and I'm a private business, and I'm checking around going, you know what, that still makes sense, I can do it. If not, it's a big world, and everyone is producing something. <laughs> Mr. Perry, the Federal Reserve currently is currency manipulation. say that nobody can do any trading of goods or services with the country that is involved in currency manipulation, that nobody can do any goods or, or uh, trade with the United States because we currency manipulate. Regarding free trade, I've got it written right here. It says, no government shall interfere with the trade of goods or services. That's all you need for free trade agreements. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. What should be done about the Federal Reserve? Is there a legitimate function for the Fed? It's time to kill the bank. As Andrew Jackson said, you are a den of vipers and I will rout you out, and by God, I will rout you out. And the Federal Reserve can be ended not through an act of Congress, but through competition. If we can allow gold, silver, and bitcoins to compete against the Federal Reserve, we will have alternative monetary institutions. We've gone without a central bank in, uh, three times in our history. Thomas Jefferson believed that we don't need a central bank. We can have a free market in money because money is not a creation of government. Money is a creation of the marketplace. Allow a free market in money and we will restore prosperity in America once again. Yeah! Dr. Feldman, it appears the Fed's not very popular in the room. First, end the Fed, end the Fed, end the Fed, and then end the Fed. Mr. McAfee. We got along without the Fed for 150 years, and we were doing quite fine. There is no purpose for the Fed other than to feed money into the pockets of the powerful and the special interest. It can end as easy as possible. Mr. Perry. Let's repeal the legal tender laws that caused Bernard von Nothaus to go to prison for competition with the Fed. And then we can end the Fed. And I believe that was a felony. Governor Johnson. As President of the United States, if Congress were to submit legislation to me to end the Federal Reserve, I would sign that legislation. But I don't think, I don't think they're going to send that legislation to me. I don't think that that's going to happen. But if they did, I would sign it. I think that those functions could be taken up by regional banks. That said, it is a rigged game. When banks are able to get money at 0%, they're able to take away our opportunities, for example, from the 2008 financial crisis where we could have stepped in, those of us that saved money, and actually bought houses at a real bargain, but no, we weren't allowed to. The big banks were able to step in and scoop that up for themselves, and now we have this reinflation bubble that has occurred with regard to housing. So it is a rigged game. We need to audit the Federal Reserve. Uh, I think the reason why we haven't had a bill to audit the Federal Reserve is just how frightening it might be to find out how many assets, in fact,
they are buying all across the world, and that might cause a collapse of sorts if that were actually known. Governor Feldman. Governor Feldman, what government cabinet departments would you eliminate? I wouldn't uh, eliminate any one of them. I would let the American people eliminate all of them by replacing them with voluntary private sector programs that are more efficient, more productive, and better for America. Mr. McAfee, what government cabinet positions would you eliminate? I think every cabinet position is merely an avenue to spend money unnecessarily that we have sweat hard to provide to the government. All of them, and we'll start from scratch to see what's needed after everything is gone. Mr. Perry, are there any government cabinet positions you would retain? No. <laughs> the question is, which one would I eliminate first? And, well, you know, let's just go alphabetical. That's the easiest way. <laughs> Governor Johnson. Of course, uh, as President of the United States, it's subject to what Congress submits to you at the end of the day. Uh, count on me to sign off on any legislation that abolishes any federal agency, but those that come to mind, if I were the dictator and could wave a magic wand, would be the Department of Commerce, Housing and Urban Development, Education. I realize this is not a, a, a cabinet agency, but an agency, a, a Drug Enforcement Administration, NSA. NSA is, a, uh, is an executive order, 12333, uh, signed under Truman. Turn the satellites away from us, please. Turn them on the enemies. Well, ostensibly, we, we're, it's been turned on the enemies, us, and this is the government. This is, this is tyranny. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Pearson, what government cabinet positions would you eliminate? Well, I'm from Missouri, and we love our guns and our whiskey, which is why I think that the ATF, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms industry ought to be a store, not a government agency. effectively end one institution of the federal government, and that's the DEA, and here's how. We can end the federal war on drugs by instructing the chief of the DEA to set the federal drug schedule of all drugs to zero. This would effectively, this would effectively kick the war on drugs back to the states, and uh, we can end the DEA that way. Let's turn our attention to foreign policy. Mr. McAfee. What do you think of the Iran deal? Does it pose a threat to Israel? And if so, is that a concern of America? The Iran deal, where we pay an enemy hundreds of billions of dollars to do what? Build weapons, systems, and ideas to destroy ourselves? We need to get out of the internal affairs of all foreign nations, I'm sorry, and bring our troops home and stop giving military aid. Thank you. Mr. Perry, the Iran deal. Despite the fear-mongering, Iran and the companies within Iran were not trying to build nuclear weapons. They were trying to build nuclear energy. The Iran deal allows them to continue doing that. However, there's a lot of U.S. taxpayer money that goes to Iran. So there are parts that are good, parts that are bad. I've not read the document, so I don't know if the good outweighs the bad, but probably not. Governor Johnson, the Iran deal. Uh, on the surface, I initially supported the Iran deal. It just made sense, but this may just sound crazy, but it turns out that Iran is categorically proven to finance terrorism. They are the number one financiers of terrorism around the world. And, if we, and because we released $165 billion, Secretary of State Kerry himself admitted that some of this money would go to terrorism. No, we should not have signed the Iran deal. We should have not unfrozen those assets. We could have engaged in free trade on an ongoing free trade basis, but no, to have released that $165 billion, uh, there will be terrorism funded out of that. Mr. Peterson. Well, here comes the wonky journal 
journalist who's actually done the research here. The Iran deal was problematic because it was an executive agreement and not an act of Congress. The Senate is supposed to approve the ratified treaties, not the President. Congress authorized the President to make it. No, I, I believe I believe that we should we should have free trade with all countries despite what their status is. Why? Because capitalism brings down tyranny around the world. Dr. Feldman, the Iran deal? Behind the Iran deal are two groups of people whose crazy, irrational hatred of each other are putting the whole world at risk of war. I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> we have plenty of issues here to deal with and plenty of people to trade and help around the world. Uh, before dealing in the military adventures of other areas. Thank you. Mr. Kerry, President Obama has called the Hiroshima bomb an act of evil. Do you agree? Absolutely. Whenever you nuke a large city and kill, what was it, millions of people, that's absolutely deplorable. President Obama was the first U.S. president to go to Hiroshima since the bombing. However, he did not apologize, and I will as soon as possible. Governor Johnson, Obama called the Hiroshima bomb evil. Do you agree? I don't want to judge actions that happened so many years ago. Uh, president Truman was faced with an obviously difficult situation based on millions of lives having been lost. I don't want to second guess in any way. One of the questions that I have regarding the bomb was, one bomb was dropped. What were the, and perhaps this is in history and I'm just not aware of it, but after one bomb was dropped, why was there not as much outreach as possible to have prevented the second bomb? But uh, I, I'm not second guessing here. Difficult decision made in difficult times and millions of lives had been lost, and so many of those lives were American lives. And we'd have lost hundreds of thousands of more American lives if we'd have had to go into the Mr. Peterson, the Hiroshima bomb was called evil by President Obama. Do you agree? Hey, no offense. You started, I'm going to end it. Let me tell you something. When it comes to the bomb, the bomb is just like any other weapon, just like a tool, like a drone, or a gun, or anything like that. If you face an existential threat, you have the right to defend yourselves. And under no circumstances would I ever endanger the national security of the citizens of the United States. That being said, the Japanese were killing 6,000, 6,000 civilians a month. 6,000 civilians a month, the Bataan death, death March and the rape of Man King. We have a right to defend ourselves using any means necessary. Absolutely. Dr. Feldman. Often who is evil and who is desperately trying to survive <laughs> depends on which side of the gun you are on. Yeah. Unfortunately, you have to do what you have to do. Whether it's evil, I don't know, but there is suffering, tremendous suffering, and I wish that it was not necessary, as I'm sure everybody does. But the question is, what is the president going to do? And there are tough decisions to be made that have to be made. We have to make a safer and more peaceful world where we take care of each other instead of fighting with each other. Mr. McAfee. An apology costs nothing. And what might it buy? Please, this is not an emotional issue. We have, we have someone who felt offended. Good Lord, have you never apologized to your spouse for something you can't even remember doing? <laughs> so what does it cost, what does it pay? Please. Governor Johnson, do you believe radical Islam poses a threat to Europe, America, to Western civilization itself? I'm sorry? Do you believe radical Islam poses a threat to Europe, to America, to Western civilization itself? 
Uh, I do. It's a very real threat. Uh, I think that Congress needs to get involved in decision making on how we address this. They have abdicated their responsibility uh, to the president and to the military, and we need an open debate and discussion on how we do deal with this, something that, like I say, has not happened. Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Truly the most dangerous religion in the world is statism. But yes, classical liberalism must be defended from violent ideologies. But if we are to do so, we must do so constitutionally, and not necessarily always through force of arms. The Enlightenment must be restored, and classical liberal thinking must be defended. And I say that if we are going to fight radical Islam as President of the United States, we must do so within the law, constitutionally, and never go outside the powers of the executive branch. Only go to war if there is a declaration of war. Otherwise, letters of mark and reprisal, and that is the only way that the President has any authority to defend the United States using the U.S. military. to Europe, America, and to Western civilization. There is no Islamic terrorism. There are Muslim terrorists. We need the people to take the blame, not a religion. Terrorism is not a war, it's a crime. You know how to fight a crime, you fight them as criminals. Mr. Nathalie? Terrorism, of course, poses a threat, but there's a far greater threat, and that is the actions of our government, which, government which created this terrorism. We drop bombs on families, on hospitals, on innocent people, as well as perhaps the guilty. My God, you would be angry too. You would be frustrated, and why would you do it? So if, if we are the source of the problem, the biggest, threat to us is our government, please. We must stop our own aggression. Mr. Perry. We, the members of the Libertarian Party, rise in opposition to the cult of the omnipotent state. Tyranny is tyranny and hides behind many religions, but the tyrants are doing the hiding. Freedom is the answer, not more government, not blaming people's religion because tyranny is the problem. Mr. Peterson, was it wrong for America to have intervened and fought in World War I? Was it wrong for America to have intervened and fought in World War II? It was wrong to intervene in World War I because the sinking of Lusitania, actually they found out that there were munitions. So they were violating the law by sneaking munitions in past the embargo. But when, after we are attacked in World War II, we have every right to defend ourselves. But we would have never gotten involved in World War II if we would have stayed the hell out of World War I. Dr. Feldman? There were a lot of bright people, and I'm sure if they could find a way not to get into war, they would have done it. I don't have the egotism to try to say that I have a better idea to what I've done at that time. It was a horrible situation, and I don't know whether anything could have been done differently. Mr. Matthew, question, please. Was it wrong for America to have intervened and fought in World War I? Was it wrong for America to have intervened and fought in World War II? Does it matter? Well, in World War II, I mean, our entire Pacific fleet was destroyed. We certainly had the right to defend ourselves. What would have happened had we not gotten into the war? In World War I, a far more complex affair, and way beyond my time. I'm sorry, I do not have the information to answer. <laughs> Mr. Perry, you most certainly have the right to defend yourself, but you do not have the right to provoke someone to attack you in order to defend yourself. The United States military had boats off the shore of Japan to provoke an attack from Japan so that they could claim self-defense. Was it wrong to intervene? Yes, because I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. At some point becomes aggression. Governor 
Johnson, was it wrong for America to intervene in World War I to intervene in World War II? I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Feldman, we spend more on our military than the next 15 or so nations combined. How large shall our military be? Do we spend too much? Where would you cut? I tell people I'm not an anarchist or a minarchist. I'm an agnarchist. I'm agnostic. I don't know how big our government should be. I want every no, tax... No, our military. And, and military is part of it. I want every American to decide how much of their taxes do they want to use to support their fellow man and how much to send to our government for drones and surveillance and all the things that support our military industries. We used to manufacture weapons to support our war efforts. Now we manufacture war efforts to support our war weapons industry. Mr. Madden. America claims to love peace, and yet we are the most warlike nation on the planet. Name a country that has not been affected by our military activities directly or indirectly. If you can name one, I'll eat one of my shoes. So they do not exist. We do not need to have troops overseas. We can find a use for them here. Some people may have noticed we have problems, real problems here at home. Mr. Perry. We do not need troops in 150-something countries and nearly 900 military bases. I would dare say we do not need a standing army, but at the very least, I will say we do not need a standing army funded through theft and coercion. The military should be as big as it can be off of donations and bake sales. <laughs> Governor Johnson, we spend more on our military than the next 15 or so nations combined. How large should our military be? We spend too much. Where would you cut? I think we spend more than all the other countries in the world combined, uh, just by a little bit, but more than all the other countries in the world combined. Uh, I would look to reduce the size of the military, and I don't say defense, I say that it's offense and it's the military. I would be looking to reduce those expenditures by 20%, and that wouldn't be going back but a handful of years. Uh, I think you need a real skeptic at the table when it comes to military budgets. The fact that we have 100,000 troops on the ground in Europe, does anybody see the logic in that? And yet, it continues to go on and on and on. As I mentioned earlier, we have executive treaties not implemented by Congress. We have executive treaties with 69 countries that we are obliged to defend their borders. This just doesn't seem right. The fact that we have bases anywhere in the world, when right now we can fly uh, aircraft from the United States and because of our, of our refueling capabilities, we really don't need any Air Force bases. So how about a skeptic and let's start with a 20% reduction in the military which would not reduce our ability to provide for an impenetrable national defense. Defense. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. My pick for Secretary of Defense, General Mad Dog Mattis, had a philosophy, and that is be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet. I do think we need a strong national defense, but the focus is on defense. We have not had an audit since before 9-11 as President of the United States. I will demand an audit of the Pentagon. The Pentagon has spent $1.5 trillion on an F-35 program that can't even compete with the F-16. I will find the waste, fraud, and abuse, and we will make meaningful cuts to the military, and we will put a stop to the military-industrial complex in the United States. Mr. McAfee, would you, as President, pull the United States out of NATO, the International Monetary Fund, and or the United Nations? Absolutely, on all three, there is no doubt. Mr. Perry? Absolutely, as soon as possible. Yeah. Governor Johnson? Uh, I think that we 
we should have diplomacy to the hilt. I mean, we should engage ourselves in diplomacy to avoid what would, in fact, and is, in fact, a military conflict. I think the greatest threat in the world right now is North Korea. At some point, Kim is going to have intercontinental ballistic missiles that work. How about engaging China in, in a hand-in-hand, -hand, let's, uh, let's do something about uh, North Korea, uh, let's do something about Kim, unify the Koreas, and be able to um, withdraw our 40,000 troops that are in South Korea. Mr. Peterson, if you pull the United States out of NATO, the International Monetary Fund, and or the United Nations. If the Congress were to send me appropriate legislation, absolutely. Dr. Feldman? I kind of like the United Nations because it doesn't do much. And it's like our Facebook account. It keeps track of what other people are doing. It tells us who our friends are. And it's often a big waste of time. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Perry, are libertarians isolationists? Absolutely not. Calling me an isolationist for not wanting to invade Poland is like calling me a hermit because I don't go and invade my neighbor's fridge. Switzerland has one of the best foreign policies in the world and they are in no way isolationist. How many people have ever had Swiss chocolate, Swiss cheese, and a Swiss army knife? My intervention is not isolation. Governor Johnson. Make no mistake, if the United States is attacked, we will attack back. And we should have an invincible national defense, uh, not offense. And so diplomacy to the hilt. Engage countries in talk, in negotiation. Ultimately, negotiation, I think, is free trade. Free trade, I think, unites the world, and that's something that needs to be always promoted. Uh, but no, the United States, as President of the United States, no, um, I'm not isolationist. Mr. Perry, Mr. Peterson. It is not we non-interventionists who are isolationists. It is those who go and bomb foreign countries and cause people to hate us that, that cause us to be more isolated in the world. Isolationists. Isn't isolationism splendid sometimes? We have Amish in this country, and they like to have their isolation. That's freedom. That's secession. People ought to be free to be isolated if they so desire. But it is not we non-interventionists who want us to be more isolated. It is time for the government to get the hell out of the Middle East and bring the troops home. Yeah! Dr. Feldman, are libertarians isolationists? We're not isolationists. We just believe in intervening by dropping philanthropy, tourism, free speech, and free trade on other countries instead of bombs. Mr. Magnifi. Is a country minding its own business isolationism? Is a country opening its borders to free trade and to immigration, isolationism? No. no, it's the opposite of isolationism. Isolationism is wanting to impose your will, your culture, and your own way of life, and our own arrogance onto others in the world. <laughs> Let's turn our attention to social policy. Governor Johnson, as between the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, which is the most anti-freedom, anti-libertarian? Or put another way, from a libertarian point of view, which is the lesser of two evils? <laughs> That's like this is a slam dunk. No, they're, they're both equally, you know, they equally have their warts. And I do say warts. Let's, let's engage them in civil dialogue. Uh, the opportunity exists this election to really uh, take from both sides to try and point out that each side has their uh, has their strong points, uh, and that's what the Libertarian Party represents. Are those strong points on each side? Yeah. Yeah. They call us the third party, but I 
we think we feel like we live in a one-party state because we, they're really just two wings of the same bird. And one wing loves war and socialism and stimulus and bailouts, and the other one loves welfare and corporatism. The Libertarian Party is the second party in the United States, and while I'm president of the United States, we will finally be a two-party system again. Dr. Feldman. Hillary Clinton said that Donald Trump was not qualified to be president. Donald Trump said that Hillary Clinton is not qualified to be president. For the first time, I think they're both right. <laughs> Mr. McAfee. The lesser of two evils is still evil. What we, are dealing with, what we are dealing with are two machines. That's all they are. They have no heart, they have no soul, and they eat up everything that gets caught into them. We're not dealing with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. We are dealing with two machines, and the question is, would you rather be ground in a meat grounder or sliced and dice? This is it. I would choose mine. Mr. Perry. They are both equally evil, and to ask which one is the lesser evil is like asking my favorite STD. <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> Mr. Peterson, when does life begin? At what point has a pregnancy gone so far that it should be a crime for a woman to have an abortion? Well, I am not a scientist or a doctor. I do not know when life begins. I believe it most likely begins at conception. And that means that all humans deserve the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that includes the unborn. Dr. Peterson? I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Feldman, when does life begin? At what point has the pregnancy gone so far that it should be a crime for a woman to have an abortion? I have my own very firm religious convictions. Uh, I don't uh, mix dairy products and meat products, but I don't think a cheeseburger should be illegal. We have a pro-life community. They should be able to enforce their rules on their community. We have a pro-choice community. They should be able to enforce their pro their views on their community. And if they want to spread their message, they should invite other people by example to show what a wonderful community they have. It's not the job of government. When does life begin? At what point has pregnancy gone so far that it should be a crime for a woman to have an abortion? I have no idea when life begins, and I don't think anyone here does either. I do know what it means to be with a woman who is forced to face this choice. And I do know that at a certain point, certainly early on, the fetus is indistinguishable on the body of the woman, connected by the same blood, fed by the same nutrition. Um, it is an extraordinary complex problem, but until you are faced with that issue as a woman, or as the father. You know, it is your choice. It is your choice. <laughs> Mr. Perry, the question of abortion is one that is intended to just divide us. I do know that government should not be involved. Money should not be stolen from anyone to pay for any abortion or any abortion alternative services. Is there a point beyond which, in your opinion, a pregnancy should be illegal? You can terminate a pregnancy without killing the unborn child. And I believe that people should be allowed to adopt said unborn child should they want to do so. Governor Johnson. I don't think that most people realize that the law of the land is Casey versus Planned Parenthood. And what the law of the land says is that a woman has the right to have an abortion up to the point of viability of the fetus. And the Supreme Court defines that as being able to sustain the life of the fetus outside of the womb, even if by artificial means. That's the law of the land. 
That said, I don't think it should, there should ever be criminal penalties uh, against a woman. And that said, how can there be any more difficult choice uh, than having an abortion? The issue should only be with the woman involved, and I support the woman in making that most difficult of choice. Dr. Feldman. Do you believe in any form of gun control? Should a yes. child be able to walk into a gun store and get a gun? What about ex-felons? What about automatic weapons like AK-47s or M-16s? I believe in gun control. I believe people should control their guns. I think criminals shouldn't be able to get guns. I don't know how to stop them because they don't seem to follow the law. Mr. Madison, do you believe in any form of gun control? I, I probably am the, I'm the most gun uh, advocate in this room. If you find a picture on the internet where I'm not carrying a gun, that's a rare, a rare photograph. Um, well, no, I do not. Our Constitution has no limits. It doesn't say we have the right to bear arms unless you're under 21, unless you're not a criminal, or unless you're carrying one with a 15-round magazine. No, absolutely not. Let your parents, if you're underage, decide when you can learn to 20, uh, shoot the 22 after you've learned how to cross the fence without shooting yourself. No control. None. Mr. Perry, those who advocate disarming felons for life believe that humans cannot be rehabilitated. I have a friend who 20 plus years ago served eight and a half years in prison for a murder that he did not commit, but he was involved in. Those who advocate gun control say that he should not be able to defend himself, his wife, or his seven-year-old child. I support the right to self-defense, regardless of someone's past, because I believe that humans can rehabilitate themselves. Governor Johnson, do you believe in any form of gun control? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I've been a gun supporter my entire life. Uh, in uh, 1995, as governor of New Mexico, I got to sign concealed carry legislation, which at that time was really uh, cutting edge. Uh, I've stood up through our America initiative uh, to initiatives to uh, limit the number of bullets in the magazine, uh, limit the caliber of bullets. Look, I'm just in the belief that if you uh, if you start limiting uh, big caliber guns, only criminals are going to have big caliber guns. If you're going to if, if you're going to try and take the guns away from everybody, the criminals are going to be left with the guns. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Well, I believe in gun control. I think that we need to control the government's use of guns. <laughs> I believe in a world where gay married couples can protect their marijuana fields with fully automatic machine guns, baby. <laughs> the Constitution of the United States says shall not be infringed. It is an enumerated right, and it doesn't say muskets. It says arms. We have the right to bear arms, and that right will be protected under a Peterson administration for once and for all. Should one have to get a government-issued license to marry, if same-sex marriage should be legal, what about multiple spouses? Where, if anywhere, would you draw a line? Licenses for love, or how do we choose to uh, deport ourselves after going to bed or before? Good Lord, what right does anyone have in this, this bedroom it doesn't matter what the sex is, or how many people may or not be there. Good <laughs> Lord. No, absolutely not. Since he answered the first part, I'll answer the second. Where do I draw the line? When you force someone into a relationship. All things consensual should be illegal. No one should go to jail for anything unless they cause unjust harm to another person. Governor 
Johnson, where, if anywhere, would you draw the line? Well, uh, initially I said we should get government out of the business of marriage completely. But it turns out that there, and, and this was in response to uh, gay marriage and the ability of same-sex couples to marry or marry whomever it is that you love. Uh, get government out of that business. Well, it turns out that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of laws that actually contain the word marriage uh, and that would have to be amended. Hundreds, thousands of laws that would have to be amended as opposed to government recognizing uh, same-sex marriage, one piece of legislation. Uh, that was my then support of one piece of legislation. Mr. Peterson. I believe in a total separation of marriage and state. The government has no business interfering in private contracts between consenting adults, no matter how many. Dr. Feldman. I don't need a concealed carry certificate. I don't need any kind of marriage license. I don't need a marijuana grower's permit. I have a constitution. What I need is a government that honors it and doesn't ask for licenses and permits and certificates for things that are not the government's business. public sector, one shall use the bathroom that corresponds with the gender on his or her birth certificate. How do you feel about that law? My question is, where does Buck Angel go to the potty if he goes into North Carolina? If you don't know who Buck Angel is, and based on the applause, most of you probably don't, so I'll tell you. Buck Angel is a transgender porn star. Buck Angel was born a female. Buck Angel now looks like Adam Kokesh. Only pop. But Buck Angel still has a vagina. The Republicans in North Carolina say that Buck Angel should go to the ladies' room. I think that is wrong. Governor Johnson. As governor, I did have the distinction of possibly vetoing more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. Uh, if this legislation would have been put on my desk, uh, I would have vetoed it. Mr. Peterson. The problem with socialists is that they confuse the distinction between government and society. If it is a government building, then perhaps there should be a unisex. But private property owners have the right to discriminate if they so choose, and that is freedom. Dr. Feldman. As a physician, I think it's a very good idea to have two separate bathrooms. One for people who wash their hands, and one for people who don't. Mr. McAfee. I have traveled extensively, and in much of the third world, people use the bathroom in the street, in front of everybody. So from that perspective, I cannot see how anyone could care. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like some bizarre smoke screen to me. I'm suspicious of everything. If we have that much attention on something so trivial, something else is happening behind it. <laughs> Let's turn to some general questions about liberty. Governor Johnson, what kind of person would you put on the Supreme Court and should Congress hold hearings on Obama's nominee? Uh, Congress should hold hearings on Obama's uh, nomination. Uh, I think that constitutionally he did his duty, and constitutionally uh, the uh, Congress should do theirs. Um, that said, uh, I all 
always uh, prided myself on the appointments that I made, and I always made it a point to personally um, conduct those interviews myself. So with regard to judges in New Mexico, uh, vacancies that occurred, uh, I think that, um, I think my reputation was is that I appointed really damn good judges. And it was really based on personal integrity, questions that I am, uh, asked, I would ask the hypothetical, would you, uh, would you administer the death penalty for someone who um, committed graffiti? Uh, the legislature passed the bill, I signed it, uh, the Supreme Court upheld that yes, you could administer the death penalty graffiti for graffiti, and here it is, you've got the first case sitting in front of you uh, for graffiti, the guy admits to it, what would you do? Well, a lot of them said, hey, the law is the law, I'd uh, sentence him to death. Some said, well, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I just, the best answer of all was, you know what, if I had that situation, uh, I would have to resign because I would um, believe that unethically that I, I, I could not administer that, uh, that sentence. Mr. Best answer, though, they, got, they got jobs. They oftentimes got the appointment. Mr. Peterson, what kind of justice would you put on the Supreme Court and would you hold hearings, should Congress hold hearings on Obama's nomination? Yes, Congress should obey the law, but when I am President of the United States next year, let's put my old buddy, Judge Andrew Napolitano, on the Supreme Court. justice with a keen mind, a big heart, a stiff spine, and a knowledge and respect for our Constitution. Yeah. As far as uh, Obama's uh, uh, nomination to, of a justice, I want to support the Congress's firm right to do nothing. It's the one thing they do well. <laughs> Mr. Matthew. What good can any judge do if our system of law is broken? There exist, there exist in America more laws than an average reader could read, reading 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 600 years. Please, why don't we have a budget for law? And every time you throw one in, you have to throw one out. We got by with 10 for thousands of years. So, does it matter if we have a broken legal system created by Congress? Jesus could not judge properly. <laughs> right on cue. I didn't know he was in the house. <laughs> Mr. Perry, Mr. Perry. Yes, Congress should hold hearings, they should also vote, but I would say vote them down, not because I want to play partisan politics, but because all of the justices that are being nominated are all horrible statists. As far as who would I nominate for a Supreme Court vacancy, well, there's a great Supreme Court judge in the state of Arizona who is a libertarian, Clint Bollock. He's a co-founder of the Institute for Justice. He would stand up for your liberty, and I would put him on the Supreme Court as soon as possible. Mr. Peterson, reportedly some 83% of law professors are Democrats. As a libertarian, you must think this has real-world consequences. What are they? Boy, that's tough. I've uh, never met a damn Democrat that I liked. Let me tell you something. The Democrats are not the problem. It is the belief in the authority of the federal government. In order for us to have a freer society, the problem is not with the two-party system. The problem is with the idea that we are in a left-right paradigm. It's black and white thinking. We cannot always blame the parties for our problems. The problem is the government. Dr. Feldman, if 83% of law professors are Democrats, is this a problem? Well, the Democrats have tyrants, they have oppressors, they have demagogues. I assume they have some good people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, hopefully the professors have been appointed for a reason, and I'm sure that uh, just like uh, the Democrats or Republicans, once we have a libertarian 
president, I think, will hear all across Congress and Senate, that's great, because I always was a libertarian. <laughs> Mr. McAfee, reportedly 83% of all law professors are Democrats. How big of a problem is this? I've been sued over 200 times, so whether they are Democrats or Republicans does not seem to matter to me. Uh, I believe that rather they are all the left-hand of Satan. <laughs> Mr. Perry, since I despise Republicans and Democrats equally, I'm not concerned about how many are Democrats, I'm concerned about how many all of our horrible statists. The problem is not the political affiliation of the lawyers or the law professors, it's that we have a system that requires us to have so many lawyers. <laughs> Governor Johnson, if 82% of law professors are Democrats, how big of a problem is this? Well, I think that 83% of all professors are Democrats. <laughs> and uh, how big a problem is this? You know what, I think libertarians probably uh, agree with those professors about 75% of the time. This is the, this is the opportunity we have here uh, to bring together uh, those law, those professors. That's the opportunity we have here to bring together those Democrats. Uh, along with uh, smaller government. Look, we get to a T in the road when it comes to economics, uh, but if we can agree on so much, um, you know what? Um, the discussion then opens up to how government is oppressive, to how government is tyrannical, uh, and how we can change uh, to have and, and actually accomplish lesser government. Dr. Feldman. If a parent chooses not to send his or her child to school, should the government intervene? Yes, the government should send some people over there to see what a great job they're doing. <laughs> Mr. Madison. No, sir. Mr. Perry. Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry? Can you repeat the question? If a parent chooses not to send his or her child to school, should the government intervene? Absolutely not. The government should not be concerned about where a child is or is not at any given time. The government should not be running the schools. The government should not be intervening when people decide to let their child walk down the street to go to the playground. Yeah. Yeah. Governor Johnson. No, the government shouldn't intervene, but what we should have is we should be encouraging educational entrepreneurs to be able to have a crack at being able to educate that child in a way that would suit the parents. I, I just see an incredible opportunity in this country that has gone unmissed. unmissed. Look, I think education should be at the state level to start with 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice, but the states that are gonna show the best practice are when they involve competition for public education that would reach out to this kid and perhaps uh, satisfy the parents uh, in a way that they're currently not being addressed at all. Mr. Peterson. For too long and too often, public education has been about indoctrination. No, absolutely not. The government should not. I believe in homeschool. I do believe in doctors. And I think that we should have a separation of education and state. Mr. McAfee, should all drug use be made legal or decriminalized, whether marijuana or heroin? What do you say about people who argue that if you do that, it would lead to more rampant drug abuse. The drug use is remain constant, whether it is criminalized or decriminalized, and all drugs should be decriminalized. I have been in prison more than I'm sure most of you, or any ten of you combined, for drug use. So I promise you, that has stopped me, or did not until at the age of 38, I've been clean since 38. It did not stop me from using drugs. Nothing will. Neither if it were free would I have used any more. I used as much as my body would tolerate of everything. <laughs> Mr. Perry, I read statutes for fun, and so far I have yet to find the word tomato in any statute. 
But I don't think anybody here would say that tomatoes are not legal. I think that every substance, where it, whether it be cannabis or crystal meth, should be absolutely as legal as tomatoes. There should not be any regulations on how much you buy, grow, sell, possess, consume, sell to your neighbor, give to your neighbor, throw in the air to land on the ground, wherever it may be. No regulations. Everything should be as legal as tomatoes. Governor Johnson. In 1999, I was the highest elected official in the United States to call for the legalization of marijuana. I think that's, I think that's good news. In 2016, I'm still the highest elected official in the United States to call for the legalization of marijuana. Although apparently Bernie Sanders is advocating such, and I think a lot of that has to do with his appeal along, among millennials. Look, I think when we legalize marijuana, we'll, we will take a quantum leap in this country with regard to drug use. If we were to legalize all drugs tomorrow, the world would be a much better place. 90% of drug problems are prohibition related, not use related. That is not to discount the problems of use and abuse, but that should be the focus. Drugs are dangerous. Drugs are dangerous because they're illegal. Drug dealers don't check IDs. When people take drugs, they don't know what they're getting. I believe that if we were to decriminalize all drugs, that we would be living in a safer world. But that's the political issue. The moral issue is that you own your life, you own your body, and you ought to be able to put it in what you please, provided you harm no one else. should be normalized like caffeine and chocolate. <laughs> Drug abuse is a medical problem. It shouldn't be a legal problem. If that worked, we should make cancer illegal, diabetes illegal, hypertension illegal, and we would have a much better, safer, healthier country. make certain drugs illegal for children. As I said, everything should be as legal as tomatoes. I think people are smart enough to know not to give heroin to a child unless under the direct supervision of a doctor. I don't think that people should go to jail. And again, I'm guessing you're defining child the legal way, not the medical way. And those are two distinct things. But again, people are smart enough to know and not to give horrible, horrible things to children. Let's look at Portugal, and I'm going over time because everybody else has. Let's look at Portugal for a second. They decriminalized everything 15 years ago. Drug use, drug abuse dropped drastically. Everybody's safer because they're not afraid to go get help if they need it. Right now in this country, people are afraid to go get help because if they go to the doctor, the doctor will call a damn cop. Well, the reality is, is that no law is going to pass to legalize drugs unless it contains a provision uh, that children are not allowed to use it. Now that said, as a parent, I mean, my message to my kids was, was look, I'd be naive to think that you wouldn't be trying these drugs. But the problem with drugs is quality, quantity, unknown. It's prohibition. And first and foremost, I love you. I love you both. So if you find yourself in a position of being impaired, whether it's alcohol or drugs of any kind, call me, because I'm gonna come and I'm gonna pick you up because I love you. And that's what we need to tell our kids is that we love you. authority to regulate drugs. That being said, at the state level, I would 
support some legislation that would stop children from being allowed to purchase drugs and prosecute anyone who would put a child in danger. Because I do believe that children do need some protection. Yes, you should not be able to sell heroin to a fiber. Before we can sell a drug, it has to be tested to make sure it's safe and effective. Congress has a similar mechanism for laws. Before they, test, before they pass any law, they test it very carefully to see its effect on campaign contributions. <laughs> if a parent would endanger their child, there's worse problems in that family than drugs. Yes. We need to go to the root of the problem, which generally is only made worse by government. There's a lot of problems and a lot of suffering in the world. Adding criminal punishment doesn't help. Mr. McAfee, would you at least make certain drugs illegal for children? If a child goes out to buy drugs and the parents don't know they're gone or where they are, there's a problem. If the child has the money to buy drugs, where do they get it? Aren't you missing it? And when a child comes home stoned and you do not notice it, the problem is not with the seller of the drugs, it is with the parents. <laughs> Governor Johnson, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended discrimination in both the private sector and the public sector. Senator Barry Goldwater voted against it for libertarian reasons. He did not feel it was the government's job to tell a private business owner what to do. Senator Al Gore Sr. voted against it because he opposed integration. If you had been in the Senate, how would you have voted? I would have voted for it. No elaboration? Nope. You still have more time? <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Repeat the question one more time. Mr. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended discrimination in both the private sector and the public sector. Senator Barry Goldwater voted against it for libertarian reasons, feeling that it wasn't the government's job to tell a private owner what to do. Senator Al Gore Sr. voted against it because he imposed racial integration. How would you have voted had you been in the Senate? Wait, you just... Sorry? You're asking whether or not I would have signed the civil rights legislation in 1964. 1964 yes. yes, I would have signed. Which is what you, which is what you Mr. Peterson, would you have signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended discrimination in both the public and private sector? Well, the senator has the power of the filibuster, so I would have filibustered until we abolished Title II, and then we would have gotten rid of the government discrimination. <laughs> Dr. Feldman, had you been in the Senate in 1964, how would you have voted on the Civil Rights Act? I would hope that I would look at it very, very carefully, end government discrimination, and when it came to private discrimination, we need to find what would cause more harm, what would cause less harm, and do what makes life better for people. And that's a very difficult decision. <laughs> Mr. McAfee? Would you have voted in favor of the 1964 Civil Rights Act had you been in the Senate? As many of you know, my wife is black. And having spent three and a half years living 24 hours a day with her, I can assure you that legislation in no way ended discrimination. <laughs> what it did is bring to the awareness that it is here. The discrimination will not end until you open your heart and your mind and your judgment to a person of another color, another race, another language, another religion. Mr. Mr. Allow me to give everyone a history lesson. The segregation in the South was not because necessarily of racist business owners, it was because of racist legislators telling the business owners that they had to segregate the lunch counters. In Virginia, it was business owners that helped the protesters violate the statute by saying, come into my business, violate the law. That should have been outlawed. The first discrimination should have been repealed. 
That is the only thing the Civil Rights Act should have done. <laughs> Mr. Peterson, I have a feeling I know how this answer is going to be. Should someone have to have a government-issued license to drive a car? Hell no! exhibited by people before they drive. As governor of New Mexico, I vetoed a whole lot of bills. I vetoed the haircutting license. I vetoed all sorts of licensing, but license to drive? I mean, you could, uh, arguably, you could have an insurance requirement, I guess, that then the insurance company would determine. I mean, you got people that are blind that would be on the road, I think, that would actually continue to drive until they hurt somebody. We, gentlemen, we have come to the end of the question and answer portion of the debate. You now have 60 seconds to make a closing argument since Mr. McAfee went first. Mr. Perry, you may go first. I stand before you today not to promise 1% in the general election, not to promise 5% in the general election, not to promise 15% in the poll. What I stand before you today to promise is that all the way through the November election, I will as boldly as possible and as consistently as possible and as loudly as possible proclaim the ideas of liberty. I want you to help me help you make the Libertarian Party Libertarian again. If you want an actual libertarian on the ticket, and you want to help the Libertarian Party actually be libertarian again, not with a watered-down message, but with an absolute message of freedom on every issue, every time, vote for me tomorrow so I walk off of this stage the Libertarian Party presidential nominee. Governor Johnson, you have 60 seconds. Well, uh, I got to run as a Libertarian in 2012, something I was very honored to carry that banner. Um, I thought my marching orders were to grow the Libertarian Party, and I think because of your efforts more than anyone else's, the Libertarian Party is growing. What I'd like to do is I'd like to fill up your current um, weekly meeting that's occurring in the uh, Treehouse, uh, to an auditorium because thousands of people are going to want to hear this message and at that meeting you can tell them, hey, Johnson's not our best candidate, um, we are, and make that argument. But here it is, we do have an opportunity and so many of you have worked for so long consistently to provide ballot access with your time and your money. And here it is, we're at a threshold here, a real threshold to grow this party and to make it better. And at the end of the day, shouldn't we try and make things better? Do we get from A to Z? No. Should we be able to articulate Z? Absolutely. But isn't D, if it comes up, if it's an availability, shouldn't we sign on to anything that makes things better? Anything that creates more freedom. Thank you.
serious strategy to actually win the White House in 2016. I offer this to you humbly, with love and affection, as sincere as the expressions of happiness and joy on the face of all my supporters. For this is not a campaign about one man. It's a campaign about a revolution of we, the people. Dr. Feldman, you have 60 seconds. Some may ask Feldman, is he that libertarian? I am that libertarian. I'm that be what you want to be libertarian, that you look good on TV libertarian, that Muslim libertarian, that Jew libertarian, that Christian, atheist, Hindu libertarian, that Rothbard libertarian, that Jefferson libertarian, you know I'm not Mexican libertarian, that LGBT Jew libertarian, no sex libertarian, that NLK Jr. Malcolm X libertarian,
nominating conventions since 2000 in Orlando. And I have voted for the presidential nomination every time. And there's always been a choice. There are always choices we have to make. And I firmly believe this year, you, the delegates of the Libertarian Party, have the best and the toughest choices that I have ever seen. Now, at the beginning of this thing, we passed out those donation cards, and I hope that you've been filling them out while listening to the awesome answers in this debate. But if you haven't, you can start filling them out now. And now I'm going to auction off a piece of history. On this stage to my right, is an extra sign, and on that sign are the signatures of every one of the candidates up here on this stage. There is only one of these in the world. If you would like to own a piece of history, a unique piece of history, to mark the turning of the Libertarian Party into a new era, it will be available tonight, and there is a maximum price. I cannot take any more than $33,400 for this sign, but only because of the government. If you are filling out your cards, when you leave, there will be volunteers with boxes in the back that can take them. Drop the envelope with them, and we will count the donations. We'll let you know at the banquet tomorrow how much we've raised. But now, I want to start by selling this sign. And I Bitcoin? We will take anything you want, Mr. Hancock. Would you like to open the bidding in how many Bitcoin? Two Bitcoin. Two Bitcoin. Can someone give me a market price on two Bitcoin? One thousand dollars in FRNs. One thousand dollars, Mr. Hancock, for two Bitcoin. Do I have another bid? Two hundred dollars. <laughs> will not be taken, dollars $1,500 right there. $2,000 in the front row. $3,000 the gentleman to my left. $4,000 second row back. $5,000 to my left. $5,500, this man wants it. 5500 is the current bid for a piece of Libertarian Party history that no one else in the world will have. $6,000 to my left. Anyone else? I know there are people who can outbid him. You don't want him to go home happy, do you? Do I hear any more than 6000 There's only one of these. <laughs> going once, going twice. Sold to the gentleman to my left for $6,000. Give him a round of applause. Show me the money. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you on C-SPAN, everybody who's watched this debate. Thank you everyone who's here. Thank you for making this possible. This is our time. This is the Libertarian Party's time. Please, fill out your cards, give them in the back. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow, bright and early for business. Woo! Woo! Where did Mark pull that from? <laughs> Never saw that man scream. Never saw a little guy like that scream. I love it. Oh my God.